could mute themselves so that we can hear our wonderful speaker. Um, I also want to let everyone know that this is going to be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, you can hop off and we'll have this video posted later if you would rather watch it then. Um, and there was one more thing. Um, Oh, questions. If you guys have questions, you can type a question into the chat and we can unmute you at the end so that you can ask your question. So I think I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker since we have so many people already. Um, we have the great honor of having Dr. Rebecca Vega Thurber to speak at Cal Academy for our virtual seminar today. And she is at Oregon State University and is the Pernod Distinguished Professor in Microbiology. Since her time at Oregon State, she has been awarded over $7 million in grant money, which I think is amazing. <laughs> and she's also uh, taught and mentored so many postdocs, PhD students, and master's students. Throughout her very distinguished career, she has published over 70 scientific articles, three book chapters, and has been cited over 13,000 times. So we are very lucky to have her today. And I would love to keep talking about all of her accolades, but I wanna leave as much time as possible for our speaker and for questions. So Dr. Vega Thurber, if you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you for that really nice introduction and thanks to everyone for inviting me and having me uh, speak to you today and thanks for everyone who who showed up today people from all over the world um, people that I've worked with in the past it's it's so good to see you all and thanks for coming a lot can be said about the zoom platform and not liking it but it is an amazing way to access new viewers and to, to reach out to people that you might not see or ever meet because they're so far away or you may be not able to attend a meeting. So thank you, Zoom, too. I can't believe I just said that, but thank you, Zoom. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and let me know that you can all see it. It's just the cover slide. Yeah, can I get thumbs Perfect. up? Perfect, yep. Okay, great. So um, uh, what I want to talk to you today about is thinking about coral reef health and causes of decline and recovery from a microbiological view. And so you see in this picture, the beautiful benthos of Morea, which is also my background. Um, but what you can't see over all of these beautiful corals and fishes is that thin veneer of microbes that live on them. And you also can't see the amazing number of microbes that live inside these organisms. And so really our lab is interested in trying to figure out who's there to create a catalog, if you will, of what organisms are present on coral reef, or on coral reef macrofauna, and then figuring out what they're doing in terms of their health, and especially in terms of how they might respond to environmental change in this era of anthropogenic climate change and other factors. So. All right, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that my university, Oregon State University, is a land grant institution that is founded on the land of the Kalapuya people. And as we move forward as a community that we need to consider our past history with these people and the land that they, we, they have taken and to move forward as a community in light of uh, relationships and building relationships and, and to make our world a better and more uh, just place. I also want to acknowledge all the people who are involved in this work. Um, I'm gonna be telling you several stories and many people have been involved in these stories, including many collaborators, past members, including one who I see here, Jesse Zanneveld, and also my current lab members. Hi, Jesse, um, um, including um, all of my students, but today I'm gonna to be focusing on the work that we've been doing in South Florida and the Caribbean. And so the work is really gonna be focused on the work of uh, Grace Klingas here, uh, Becca Maher and uh, postdoc Dr. Lydia Baker. But I'm also going to talk about Jesse's project too. And Jesse's down here. He's now University of Washington at Bothell. And I can't do any of this work without the thankful uh, help of National Science Foundation, who's been very generous to my lab. And thank you to all the taxpayers for giving your taxes so that we can have these National Science Foundation dollars to study coral reef biology. Okay, so this is my favorite starting point. This is kind of my 
Welcome to Coral Reef Slides. This is some drone footage of our lab, one of our lab sites on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. And it is a very iconic reef where it has very crystal clear blue waters due to its lack of primary nutrition, nitrogen and phosphorus that feeds the base of the food web, all basic plants in the ocean. And the other thing that you can see in this drone footage is a large number of black to gray shapes which are the corals that feed the foundation of all of the biodiversity on these habitats. If we go underwater, you can see that these reefs are dominated by, someone mentioned these postoloperid corals, you can see they're very, very abundant. And it's these organisms that are animals, but then um, associate with microalgae that feed the biodiversity, even though in reality, these, based on the crystal clear blue water, is really an ecological desert in terms of nutrition. So we love to give these facts that, you know, coral reefs, they're a very small fraction of our planet, and yet they contain so much biodiversity and provide so much economic stability, food security, and cultural enrichment to our communities. But the paradox of coral reefs is that they really shouldn't exist but they exist because of their relationships with microbes. And so many people, including many people here, study the association between the coral animal or the polyps of the animal and its endosymbiotic microalgae in the genus Symbiodinaceae, shown by these little yellow to, excuse me, yellow to green dots, right? And so essentially corals are mixotrophs where they take in photosynthate from their algal symbionts and they provide these primary nutrients in the form of nitrogenous waste and other metabolic waste back to their polyps and um, back to their algae in order to recycle those limiting nutrients. However, the full puzzle of metabolism isn't solved unless you bring in a whole nother group of microorganisms and those are the bacteria. And our lab has really been trying to understand the role of bacteria in their systems in terms of what kind of microbe host services that they provide. Now, if you look back in history, people traditionally just think thought of bacteria as the base of food webs, um, that they provide nutrition to planktivores, to grazers, that they recycle nutrients, and that they're basically involved as the base of food webs. But we now know through so many different studies, including many of your own here, that they're involved in a myriad of different factors from modulating our own digestive system and health and immune system to developing and stimulating different parts of ontogeny to being direct nutritional symbionts. And in terms of corals, there's a lot of hypotheses about there, uh, out there about that some metabolic potential of these microbes might allow corals to resist or become resilient to environmental change. But although there have been a lot of hypotheses, there's been little data. Well, I should say there's becoming more and more data about whether or not these hypotheses are true. So we and others have been taking time and effort and money to go around tropical reefs and identify the bacteria associated with different members of these reefs. And these circles are meant to represent how biodiverse microbiomes are within these reef organisms. And so one thing that we found in some of our meta-analyses in our own studies is that corals actually have pretty low diversity microbiomes. They can contain anywhere from a couple dozen to maybe a maximum of a thousand or so different bacterial types. And that each particular coral species, even though being aligned right next to each other, are gonna have distinct microbiomes. And if you look at other uh, members of the reef community from fish to seagrass to macroalgae, they all have their own interesting microbiomes with a variety of different kinds of diversity levels from very high diversity like reef water um, and seagrasses to uh, lower diversity systems like sponges, which really are specialists in some um, microbes and their relationships with their microbes. So the question that I'm going to present to you today for the rest of the talk is how is the microbiome actually involved in reef health? And can we go beyond cataloging who's there to really understanding their dynamics in response to different environmental change and how those dynamics ultimately are reflected in the health of their host organisms or in their ecosystems at large? 
So there have to, I have to give you a little background on a number of projects because I'm talking about new stuff, but a lot of the new stuff is based on old stuff, stuff that we already did and in order to enrich our current questions. And so I wanted to present to you some work that we did, including Jesse was the lead on this. Um, this was our global coral microbiome project where we really wanted to test that question about are corals associated with microbes because they live in certain places or are they associated with certain microbes because they've co-evolved with them and they use particular types. And so in order to disentangle habitat from species level associations, we went on a massive expedition, had many collaborators who collected samples in a very rigorous and formatted way all across the planet. And this is just a map of where some of the samples were to characterize the global coral microbiome, basically what's in all of the microbiome and are there specific species specific relationships? And do we see evidence for co-diversification? This was um, a project in collaboration with Monica Medina's lab. And these are some of the two gentlemen who were involved primarily in the project. And I also wanna point out that the earth microbiome was also involved in helping us sequence some of these samples. So we basically went all around the world and I'm gonna show you a single slide that summarizes some of the findings of a four year project and lots of hours in the field. So sorry, Jesse, just one slide. So basically what we did was we looked at the mucus and the tissue and the skeleton of these corals, which are different compartments of the corals that are known to have different functions. And so what we found was that the mucus and the tissue and the skeleton were, were significantly different in terms of their composition, not just across individual species, but across the different habitats within an individual species. That is, if you looked at coral A, its mucus microbiome would be distinct from its tissue microbiome, which would be distinct from its skeleton microbiome. And from all of this analysis, as well as the analysis of many other labs, um, we kind of put together a laundry list of what's available to the coral. And there's all of these different bacterial species that we can look into at an individual level now and ask questions about what is the role of Myxococcus? Why is it there? What is the role of Endozoicomonas? And why is it such a common symbiont? But today I'm really going to talk about just one member of the microbiome. And that's the Rickettsiales, because that's been a major focus of my lab for some time. Okay, so what are these different bacteria doing and how do we figure out what they're doing? We can't just have a laundry list. We can't just make, uh, we just can't do stamp collecting. We really have to move beyond that and do experiments. So the reason we have to do experiments is because of this issue, because relationships, well, they're complicated. And just because you see the presence of a microbe one time or at another, that is a dynamic relationship and it can move from a healthy relationship to a pathogenic one, from a parasitic one to a symbiotic relationship and mutualistic one. So we're really looking at the dynamics of these over time in order to figure out what they're doing. And in order to look over time, we really have to do experiments. And so I'm going to tell you just very briefly about the experiment that, kind of, that I say kind of started this whole project at large. And it was really a collaboration between Dr. Darren Berkey Pyle and I, when we were both brand new assistant professors at FIU, we found that we had a kinship in terms of the things that we studied. I studied nutrient pollution and overfishing and um, heat stress and their effects on coral microbiomes. And he studied the same factors, but at the macroscopic level, what happens to the reef itself. And so we put together this crazy experiment that we wanted to do underwater for a very long time to track both of those factors at the same time. And so essentially we manipulated two major factors, nutrient pollution because of its role in these very uh, nutrient depauperate reefs and overfishing because we know that both of those impact one of the primary changes on reefs today, which is the growth of macroalgae. We know that the growth of macroalgae can affect corals. And some of you here have actually shown that that growth of macroalgae can directly change the microbiology. And we wanted to know, well, if you do this in a very you know, didactic way, will you change the microbiome as well? Like we, with the system, will it grow? Will it change? Will it adapt? Will it acclimatize? or is it instantaneously go back to the way it was before? So we hired an amazing biologist and informatician, Dr. Jesse Zanneveld, to help us um, with this project. 
So basically this project was done off the coast of Florida. So here's Florida, here is the Florida Keys, here's Cuba, and here is the Bahamas. And this is Key Largo where our main house was set up. We lived there every summer for three years and we traveled down to this site um, every six weeks to do the experiment. Um, our site is here about seven kilometers off the reef and there's a standard CERC water chemistry site that would provide some of the metadata for understanding what the natural background of nutrients was. Some important aspects for those people who don't work in the Caribbean, at the time there was five to 7% coral cover at the site. Unfortunately, it's lower now, um, but there are large numbers of parrot fishes, so large numbers of herbivorous fishes. And so we, physically manipulated the environment and we altered two main factors. We altered the abundance of nutrients and we altered the abundance of herbivorous fishes. And by doing so, we could look at their interactions. But because we were also looking over time, we could also look at the effects of temperature change or in this case, climate change on these two independent factors and all of them together simultaneously. So what did we do? We did the classic ecologist stick where we built some cages underwater to keep fishes out. And so we built these three by three meter um, underwater manipulations where within the three meter site, we would have one meter cages. We would have four cages. Two would be have tops on them to remove the herbivores and two would be the controls. And then we had uh, eight of these sites. So four were enriched with nitrogen and phosphorus using the slow release fertilizer osmocote and four were kept at ambient levels. And you can see what these little osmocote diffusers do. They essentially poke some holes in some PVC, pour some of this osmocote in and it will diffuse over time. So this is what the plot looks like if you were to look straight down. So again, here are the exclosures here. And here are the open ones here. And this was a random design. So the way that the orientation of the different cages was, was random. Um, and here's one of the nutrient diffusers, as you see. And so these diffusers were at each individual point on the plot so that ultimately there would be a full coverage of this nutrient enrichment. So um, in terms of how much we enriched, we enriched about four times ambient of nitrogen and phosphorus. And I can give you those numbers if you're interested later. But these are not unreasonable numbers. These numbers are perfectly found in many parts of the Caribbean, so they're not entirely excessive. In fact, they're less excessive than some of the coastal water in Florida. Okay, so what do these changes do? So this was an experiment over three years. So if you look at an open plot, for those of you who work in the Pacific, this is the reality of some Florida reefs, very few corals, very low coral cover. So just a few corals here open plot, you have plenty of herbivory removing the algae, but in a fish exclosure, you have tons of algae, uh, more than 100% because the algae can actually grow on its side. So I just wanted you to see what some of the effects of these treatments were. So for the microbiology, what we did was we monthly sampled approximately every four to six weeks, about 80 individuals of three different target species. Um, for microbiome analysis. And in the past, this was 4 5 4 data um, and a 16S Amplicon data. We also did monthly maintenance where we maintained the cages, which was the hardest part, and we replaced the nutrients. Sometimes we literally had to dig through the macroalgae to find the corals. So a lot of the heavy labor was involved in just maintaining the site and finding the corals. So what did we find? So uh, Jesse, sorry to pare your amazing nature communications paper down to two slides, but this is one of the major findings that we had that basically if we were looking at the microbes as a whole, we didn't see very you know, obvious changes in the microbiology per se, but we did find that some bacteria were particularly sensitive to different factors. So the way you should look at this graph is any dot is an individual sample and, um, and uh, sorry, is an individual sample and the farther apart they are, the more different they are. And we color coded by whether or not they were dominated by specific microbial taxa. So in the case of these blues, they were dominated by synecocales. In the case of these reds, they were dominated by vibrionales. And then we color coded them also based on whether they were sensitive to particular environmental factors. So we found that vibrionales were particularly sensitive to temperature changes, as well as acetorioles. But many bacteria were also sensitive to the presence of macroalgae. So corals that were touching macroalgae tended to be enriched in Altramon dailies and a variety of other types of bacterial groups. 
And then there were some samples that didn't seem, these bacteria that were dominated by specific bacteria that didn't seem to be really affected by any one factor. Now, this is another way to look at the data. We then looked at what, is there any particular taxa that a treatment, an individual treatment that we did responded to that treatment. And so essentially anything in red responded as an increase in response to our treatment, or if it was in blue, it went down in abundance. And you can see there's a lot of increases, for example, in exclosures. But we were quite surprised that for the nutrient enrichment, there was really only one bacteria that seemed to respond intensely. And that was this bacterium, the proteobacteria alpha proteobacteria rickettsiales, which increased about 83%. And I want to remind you that this is a summary of all of the data points and across three different species. Okay, so this isn't but one species, so three different coral hosts. We found that a, as a mean 83% increase when we exposed corals to nutrients. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And serendipitously, we happened to be doing another experiment at the same time, almost on the same spot with another coral, a cropper cornus, And this was in collaboration with Liz Shaver from Duke University and Brian Silliman's lab. And she was looking at a cropper cervicornis enrichment and trying to ask whether or not, is there an interaction between snail predation and nutrient exposure? And we were asked to do the microbiology. And uh, at the time it was uh, Dr. Ryan McMines who was doing this work. And he found that corals that were exposed to control conditions in Liz's experiment had very little rickettsiales. But if you expose them to nitrogen and phosphorus, the osmocote again, that it significantly increased a lot from 8% to upwards of 88%. Now for all the coral microbiologists here, you're like, wow, that is a huge response. We almost never see a response to that degree. And then we did some microscopy. This is um, histology. This is a coral polyp here of the Acropora cervicornis. And these big black dots or purplish dots are inclusion bodies of Rickettsiales-like organisms or RLOs as they are called. Now, Ryan was very clever and he also had growth data that Liz had been taking over this experiment, which was only six weeks long, I believe. And what he found was a remarkable relationship that corals that contained rickettsiales at high abundances grew very slowly compared to those that had very little rickettsiales, they grew a lot. And I don't know if anyone else has ever seen an R squared value to this degree, but I had never in my life, I never thought I would see something like this. I was a little suspicious at first, but it worked out. And this was my first smoking gun that I've ever had in science. And it was one of those moments where I was like, I have to study this. So let's talk about rickettsiales. Okay, so what are rickettsiales? Well, rickettsiales are a well-known disease-causing agent. They're obligate intracellular for the most part. They can be extracellular. They cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They cause a variety of other diseases. They're also relatives of other members of the alpha proteobacteria that are common symbionts. So this is an image of Wolbachia inside these cells, which are well described and very, very abundant symbiont in um, the insects. Um, they're related to the ancestor of mitochondria, which so the mitochondria was once an alpha proteobacteria. And we realized that maybe the reason we hadn't noticed this before is because of this fact, because oftentimes people remove mitochondria-like sequences from their genomic data. So that's a little background on rickettsiales. Um, so we really wanted to then ask the question, what is this bacteria doing in corals and does it matter for coral health? Because there are a number of papers out at the time that were kind of equivocating. In fact, my old advisor, Forrest Rauer, had a paper that had come out on rickettsiales um, back when I was a postdoc. And so I'd heard about this, um, but there was a lot of debate about its role. It's always there, it's not there, it's a disease causing agent, it's not disease causing agent. So we really wanted to dig down into this further. So right when that paper came out, I had a brand new student, uh, Grace Klinges, a very talented student, and I gave her this sample, I'm gonna go back to it, gave her this sample here, the one at the very top of this bar graph saying, hey, this has a lot of rickettsiales in it, we think, based on 16S data. I want you to take this data and see if you can make a genome 
from the metagenome. And to be honest, Grace, if you're here, nothing against you, I really was doubtful that this would work, but Grace was inventive, dedicated, smart, and she came back just a few weeks later with a metagenome assembled genome um, of this organism shown here. And I wanna point out that she did this from a 14 million read aluminomyceic metagenome, which is a very low read metagenome, but that tells you how much of this beast was inside this coral. Um, after we did the genome, um, I'm gonna to talk to you about its phylogenetics, but we decided to name it after my ex-professor, my postdoctoral professor, uh, Forrest Rauer, because one of the first genomic evidences of this organism was in that paper when I was a postdoc. So what did Grace find about this bacterium in these Acroporocervicornis? Well, it had a very small genome, just like other Rickettsiales. It had a very high codeine density, um, about 1,500 predicted genes, and the, the mag at the time was about 97% completeness, and it also had a very low GC content. Well, Grace wasn't satisfied, so she analyzed the whole uh, genomic components of this organism from the metagenome, and this is a schematic of the functions that this organism has. Um, sometimes it's more interesting to see what they don't have. So what don't they have that you can't see here? Well, they don't have the capability to metabolize nitrogen, which is a pretty remarkable um, observation, um, but they do have the ability to sense nutrition like phosphorus and nitrogen through these two component systems up here. So they can't metabolize nitrogen and they can't make most amino acids as shown in this graphic, but they can import them. And they can also do something that a lot of Rickettsiales can do, which is steal ATP. So they have this TLC gene, which is gonna come up later in my talk, and it has the capability of importing ATP directly from the cytosol. And in many Rickettsiales um, symbioses, the Rickettsiales will sometimes be right next to the mitochondria of its host, importing or stealing energy from its host. So essentially this is an obligate parasite because it cannot make amino acids on its own. It wouldn't be able to make enough amino acids or acquire enough amino acids to survive independently. And it's an ATP parasite. Um, it's localized in several parts of the coral. So we worked with Cody Sharp to look at where it was in the coral. This is the Rickettsiales here. Um, corals are notoriously difficult to do fish on, um, but we did find it present throughout a number of spots in the coral, including the gastroderm alongside the symbiodinase. So what about this clade? Well, when, when we were working on this, we noticed that if you just blasted the sequence to other databases, that it came up very close to other coral related uh, clones from other past experiments like these Montastria faviolata corals, but it was also similar to things like placozoans. So using the whole genome and uh, a concatenated gene tree, Grace showed that this clade of bacteria is a unique genera of these Rickettsiales organisms. And so using this data, she argued to have it be its own group. And we called this group Candiatis aqua rickettsia. Why do we call it aqua rickettsia? Well, we call it aqua rickettsia because if we look in databases, particularly the red biome database, what's cultivating a whole bunch of 16S libraries in this particular uh, iteration, 1, 173,000 uh, libraries, we found that it was mostly marine associated, this bacterium, but there were a few observations of non-marine associated, but these were freshwater organisms. So we called it aqua rickettsia because it was found in, in both marine and freshwater organisms, and sometimes in things like sediments. And we don't know if that's because interstitial animals or because there's something had fallen and had been trapped there. When we're talking, when I talk in a few minutes about transmission, this will become important. Um, but importantly, uh, Grace also used the database that we had generated in the global coral microbiome data. So that this was a project that we did. So we had all of the you know, lat long data. We had very specific details about the host. And so she scanned our own database. And what she found was this organism is present at different relative abundances across corals around the world. So this is a map of the world and each circle is a, is a location where we sampled and each color within the outer rings is the different uh, 
host taxa, the different coral host. And so you can see like here in Palmyra, there's a few coral hosts that were sampled and the 104 samples, that's the number in the middle. And so you can see here that it's a ubiquitous organism present in corals. And she found that not only is it ubiquitous in corals, but it's ubiquitous in also things like sponges as well. And so that kind of told us a whole bunch of stuff about this Rickettsia leaves. These three papers now, Jesse's paper on the, the time series, Liz's experimental short-term analysis paper, um, and then Grace's genome and phylogenomics analysis. So we know it's a unique clade of bacteria that seems to be associated with many marine animals. Um, it's ubiquitous in the coral world. You can get it to grow if you add nutrients and you can increase the abundance of it, which reduces the growth, at least in one model system, um, a cropper cervicornis. So that's kind of where we were a couple of years ago. And then I said, we need to do more. We need to figure out what kind of um, relationships this organism has with a cropper in the Caribbean more generally, because we know it's associated with reduced growth and we need to figure more out about its biology. So we teamed up with Aaron Mueller. We, we wrote a grant to do this and it'll become more clear why, why Aaron Mueller. And uh, we started also working with data sets that were freely available. So in comes uh, the, uh, my amazing postdoc, Dr. Lydia Baker, who um, studies symbiosis. And she took a bunch of freely available data sets as well as ours to scan coral genome data sets for the presence of Rickettsiales. And she did so by looking at samples that had been previously collected of three different target species, staghorn corals here, elkhorn corals, and then the fused staghorn coral, which is a hybrid between these two species. Now, the reason we chose the Caribbean is because Rickettsiales have been, like I said, mentioned in many studies since 1975 in the Caribbean. And it's been associated with outbreaks of white band disease, but whether or not it's the true culprit of this disease, has been very controversial, I would say. Um, as controversial, I think, as, as I've, I've ever experienced. Um, so Lydia tackled this question with gusto and uh, started searching these databases for Rickettsiales. So basically she took these holobiont metagenomes from Florida, the Virgin Islands, Belize, and Curacao. And this was done in collaboration with Ileana Bombs Lab who generated these data that looked, they were looking at population genetics of these three species to look at their evolution. And so we said, hi, but they have Rickettsiales in them. Um, and uh, what she found was that when she looked within these databases, there was a large, almost all of the samples had Rickettsiales in them, but some had varying abundances of it. So not surprisingly, it was the staghorn coral or Acropora cervicornis that had the highest abundance of reeds that annotated towards aqua rickettsia. Okay, so remember these are metagenomes, so a lot of host sequences, a lot of symbiogenesis sequences, but also some bacterial sequences. Okay, so we identified the percentages of sequences and we found that again, almost everything had it, but in varying abundances. And here's a nice TEM of what it looks like in Acropa cervicornis. These are the little bacteria. They're quite small. Um, between half a micron and, and less than one micron in length and diameter. And um, she also then started to look, well, is there a location effect to the abundance of this? And she found that um, the burden, if you will, of aqua rickettsia differs by host and location. So there is both a location effect for how much there's present. So for example, here in Belize, you can see that the Belize acropora cervicornis has a large abundance of sequences uh, similar to aqua rickettsia um, in acropora cervicornis, but also in the hybrid uh, prolifera here in Belize. Whereas in the Virgin Islands, it's really primarily uh, more abundant in a cropper cervicornis compared to that Belize sample, for example. So it's present throughout the Caribbean. It's present in different abundances, depending on where you look and depending on what taxa it's, you're looking within. So then she uh, decided to go one step further and create metagenome assembled uh, genomes from all of these uh, holobiont sequences. And these were some of her, her basic uh, minimums. So she had a minimum number of reads. She had some standards that she wanted to um, conform to and to construct these different uh, mags. So what did she find? Well, based on this, she um, reconstructed 13 high quality Rickettsiales genomes as, 
shown here from all of the four main focal target sites, Florida, the USBI, Belize, and Belize. Oops, sorry, three, I'm sorry, three. The Curacao ones, I believe, didn't assemble. Um, they were highly complete, and these are the contamination levels and the number of genes. So you can see here that unlike um, with GRACES, uh, these are lower numbers of genes. So uh, uh, we might have overestimated um, from the original um, sequence. But they also might have fewer, as you'll see in a second. So then from these genomes, she wanted to construct phylogenies to see whether or not these bacteria were significantly different in their, uh, for example, their SNPs, their single nucleotide polymorphisms in their genome across the different locations and also at the full phylogenomic level. And you can see here that the phylogenies, they differ by location, but not necessarily by host because you can see that the colors are grouping within the trees. This was kind of, I would say a shocking result, um, but it's very strong result. And so it's definitely that a location, more like a location effect. In fact, within individual corals, it's a strong effect. So then she looked at the pan genome to see are there genes that are shared across all of the Rickettsiales? Of course there are, and that's a large majority. They, they share 547 different gene orthologs across all of the samples, but you can see that there are also some unique orthologs that are associated by location. For example, within the Florida Keys here, they have this unique ortholog set, or as in this blue one in the Belize samples, they also contain unique sets of orthologous genes, which might distinguish them um, functionally from their, their compatriots at other sites. All right, uh, another few of the things that she did was look at how fast they are evolving and um, how fast they can um, replicate. And so what she did was she compared the evolutionary rates using DNDS measurements and she compared them to well-known and well-described and well-experimented um, members of the Rickettsiales, including these tick um, mosquito um, and of now our coral associated Rickettsiales. And you can see that within Aqua Rickettsia, it's a very, very high evolutionary rate compared to these other systems that are described in insect species. Um, at the same time, there seems to be an effect by location where the Florida of Aqua Rickettsiales, Aqua, Aqua Rickettsia are evolving at a faster rate compared to USVI. She also did some measurements, including an IREP, which you can ask her about, um, to look at how fast these might be replicating within individual colonies. And she found that within Florida, the A. Rauri is not only evolving fast, but it's replicating quite fast within its target hosts compared to the USBI and Belize, and that there doesn't seem to be a significant difference when you look across the hybrid versus Cervicornis. All right, so some conclusions of Lydia's beautiful paper, which is in review, and I asked her today for the bioarchive. We, uh, we've submitted it to bioarchive, and if you guys would like, you can follow up, and I, I forgot to list it here, but we can send the bioarchive paper um, when, it, when it is certified. Um, but so basically the, the conclusions of her study was that, uh, first of all, that there seems to be a species specific burden of these aquariketsia. And so there's a possibility of either the host or other microbiome based deterrence, which can prevent massive infection of A. rauri in these different species, particularly in a crop or a palmata, which it doesn't seem to be very, it's, it's there, but it's not very high abundance. And I'm gonna talk about cervicornis genotypes. And this is also the case within species, which I'll talk about in a second. In addition, the Florida A. rauri seems to be particularly interesting. This is a less isolated population of corals, but it's undergoing higher amounts of selection. There's more speciation and it's replicating faster. So we're, we discovered this thing in Florida and it seems to remain to be really exciting and interesting within um, Florida. Another um, observation that Lydia made very intuitive observation was that based on her data, there was really no evidence when she looked at co-phylogenies between the host and the microbe, which I didn't show you that data. There's really no evidence of co-diversification of these organisms. And it appears that they're not vertically transmitted. Genetically, they don't show evidence of that. So if there, that was like a huge surprise to me because these are obligate symbionts and it would make sense that they're vertically transmitted, but she didn't find evidence of that. 
So given that the data shows that they're not vertically transmitted, well, they must be horizontally transmitted. And so we started thinking, well, we need to look into this pretty quickly. So in comes Grace, who I'm gonna talk about, um, Grace had done that original paper on the genome and she worked with Dr. Hannah Koch at uh, Moat Marine Lab, um, one of the uh, technicians and researchers there to see whether or not they could find aquarachetsia in the early stages of uh, a cropper cervicornis ontogeny. So she, they took two different uh, strains of corals, and I'll talk about these in a second, a susceptible strain, and I'll tell you, these are susceptible to disease, and I'll show you that in a second, and a resistant strain of coral. And um, they did crosses, and then they had planula. So they had eggs, sperm, planula, recruits of the coral, and then the crosses themselves. We haven't yet got to this stage, but we've tested now whether these contain um, the rickettsiales. So what did they find? Well, in the susceptible parent, we found that yes, there is aqua rickettsia. We already knew that, not surprising. That's kind of our positive control. But in the eggs and sperm, the planula and the recruits and the juveniles, no, we don't find aqua rickettsia, which confirms that these are not vertically transmitted and they must be coming in through an alternate mechanism. And we're still waiting for the outplants, um, the later stages of the outplants to come in um, to follow up on how, what, is, what is the earliest that you start to see aquarachetsia in these corals. So they're definitely environmentally acquired. And that's a really big important observation for restoration. Okay, so if they're not vertically transmitted and they're acquired horizontally, how does that work? Well, we have some evidence from this from uh, some beautiful transmission electron microscopy that was done by Will Duke for his honors thesis in my lab. And so these are some pictures of these acropora corals. These are the mucocytes we think that are filled with the aqua rickettsia. You can see that they're, they're quite different in shape here. They're very large, larger than we would imagine them to be. Um, and here's another mucocyte filled with the bacteria. Normally they're much smaller when we look at them in the gastroderm. So here's the thylakoid membrane of the symbiogenesi. And these are what the little bacteria look like. They're, they're close to the symbiont here. And so they're quite small, but they can also change shape, it seems like. And these are in the mucocytes. And for those of you who don't know, or those who do, the coral mucocytes are spewed out into the environment. And so we think that this is probably the mechanism of release, although what, how they're getting them, we don't know, but we're pretty sure that they're being released into the environment through these mucocyte packets. Okay. I also wanted to point out that Shalvi Patel was the one who helped us develop uh, the TLC gene for qPCR that uh, Grace used to determine that, that the aqua rickettsia was not present in those early stages of ontogeny. All right. In my last five minutes, this is kind of like the big question that everybody wants to know. Does rickettsia least cause disease? It seems to be present in healthy animals. It seems to be present in diseased animals. How do we, you know, make one way or the other about this? So this is really where Aaron comes in. And so I like to tell these stories because this is why I like meetings, because I was at a meeting with Aaron and I had read Aaron's work, but I'd never worked with her. And I had presented some of Grace's genomic data at that meeting. And Aaron ran up to me and she was like, hey, we don't know each other, but we should work together because I have a bunch of Acropora cervicornis genotypes and I did some microbiome analysis and I think there might be rickettsiales in them. And so we worked with her to analyze her genotypes and we found that there's a huge effect of genotype on the abundance and burden of rickettsiales. And that's shown in this figure here. So this work was done by Grace and Becca in my lab in collaboration with Erin. So Erin has a whole bunch of Acropora cervicornis genotypes that they maintain at the Moat Marine Lab nursery for outplanting and other experiments. Um, and they're designated phenotypically as either susceptible to disease or resistant. And you can see that there's many more, unfortunately, susceptible to disease genotypes than they're unresistant. This is not an unbalanced design on purpose. It just happens to be that these corals tend to be more susceptible to disease. But luckily there's two resistant ones. And so when we looked in these corals, you can see that the susceptible genotypes have a huge abundance of aqua rickettsia as shown in green. But the resistant genotypes like that Acropora palmata don't seem to really have it. Maybe a little bit, but not much of it. 
And we, she also found that when she was keeping these genotypes that in a natural bleaching event, she had the same genotypes out and she was doing this experiment. So we looked at during bleaching and we found that during bleaching, the aqua rickettsia, poof, it goes away. And we were kind of perplexed by this, you know, well, why would that happen? And then we started thinking about its genome biology. This is just to show that again, that there's a significant increase in aqua rickettsia during bleaching, but also a significant increase in other taxa during bleaching. And we think that's because when aqua rickettsia is lost, oh, where's the it's in green, it's lost here. All these new guys come in because a new niche has opened up in the corals. So the model that we think is going on, at least in these susceptible genotypes, is that aqua rickettsia, it can't make amino acids, okay? It's, and it can't, it can't make its own ATP, it steals ATP. So what we think is happening is that during normal times, the symbiodinaceae is happily making photosynthate. It's making amino acids, and then the host is, you know, adding some amino acids as well. There's other bacteria, as Stephen has shown really nicely. There's other bacteria making vitamins that are really important for the system. And aqua rickettsia is essentially laying low and stealing these resources. And maybe it's not so abundant, but if it becomes really abundant, it's over consuming the coral's resources. And so that during bleaching, it makes the corals even more susceptible to bleaching. But it is also susceptible to bleaching because once the symbiodinase is lost during bleaching, no more yummy amino acids and not a lot of extra ATP from the coral host so that during the expulsion or loss of the symbiodinase and the resources associated with that, essentially the aqua rickettsia starves. It's lost, but now all of these new opportunists, as shown in the last slide, can invade the coral. And what they do, we don't really know. We're kind of at the edge of this thinking, trying to move towards more experiments to explore this. So that's kind of my summary. So the aqua rickettsia rauri, we also know that now is associated with disease susceptibility. And we think that the mechanism is probably that it weakens coral hosts during their normal life stage because it's over consuming their ATP and their, their amino acids and other resources. So that during maybe a disease event or a bleaching event, they just can't survive. Because remember, bleaching is essentially a starvation process. Without their symbionts, they don't get sugar. So if they already are weak and now they're not getting sugar and they've been having their ATP stolen, they're even more susceptible to opportunistic infection and disease down the line. So to answer the question about whether or not they're the disease agent, I would say, they play a very important role. And you can think about this with any disease thing, right? Like who's really the trigger? If you think about HIV, HIV is a disease of a virus, but most people, at least in the early days, they didn't die of HIV. They died of infections because the immune status of that host was in decline. So I think this is a similar analogy here is that these aqua rickettsia, they, they prime the system to be less resilient to other factors, whether it be temperature stress or whether it be opportunistic infection. And we now know that these uh, pa parasites are found variably across the acropod species and that they're quickly evolving. And we also know that they're horizontally transmitted. So what does that mean for coral restoration? Well, I think that depends who you talk to. We think it's a big problem. As microbiologists, we don't want this to be spread around. So we are concerned about husbandry of these animals and potential cross-contamination of genotypes that are resistant with it. But there could also be genetic factors in place in the host that are already there to prevent the infection. And that is something that we would like to explore. And we're currently doing that with Aaron. And Hopefully in a few years, we'll have a new story for you to tell you about that host by microbe interaction and what genetic mechanisms the host might have to prevent infection or modulate infection. And at the same time, on the flip side, with the bacteria, are there specific orthological groups like Lydia found? There are some genes that are localized to particular areas. Are those sets of genes making some aqua rickettsia more virulent, less virulent? more likely to be transmitted? And all of these different questions when you think about host microbe interactions. 
So that's where I'm going to end. Again, I would really like to thank all of my lab. We're really a team. We work together. Everybody helps everybody. Um, the primary collaborators in this project were Darren Berkey Pyle um, with the long-term study in Florida, Aaron Mueller with all of the cropper server cornice work, Brian Silliman at Duke, um, and Cody Sharp at Roger Williams. Oh, I need to add now Ileana Bombs. Of course, I shouldn't have done that. I should have added Ileana Bombs at Penn State. And then all my students, and especially Dr. Baker and um, uh, Grace Klingas, who did a lot of this work as well as Becca Maher. So thank you. I'll stop sharing. We already have a few questions in the chat. So Raf, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Great, great talk, Becky. That was uh, fascinating, really. Um, and, and this is one of the things that drives me crazy about coral microbiologists is we're not chasing the individuals. And I think you've done a great job with that. Um, <clears throat> it seems like um, just from what I could gather, um, it's, there might be a closer association with the zooxanthellae than actually the coral host itself. Is there any evidence that it's really a parasite on the zooks and, and just happens to be in a certain coral species? I think we have some evidence for that, um, but not a lot of strong evidence. We find it sometimes physically located next to the gastrodermal region and nearby the symbiodinaceae, but we never find it on it. Um, it I, could be in that, say again? Um, I, I was just thinking that, you know, you see this reduced growth in the coral host itself. So maybe they're sucking the sugars away from the symbiodinium before the coral can even get it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what, what Lydia is going to do now, we're working with Xavier Molly, Miali at um, Lawrence Livermore Labs to do a nanosims experiment to see if the cross-feeding is direct from the symbiodinase of the carbon straight from the symbiodinase into the bacterium, or is there cross-feeding to the host first, then to the bacterium? Yeah, so that will be really interesting. Um, the, the TEM is really, it's, it's one of those things you're like, you can convince yourself of anything <laughs> of like, yeah, it's, it's associated with them. Yeah, it's there. But then you also see them in other places. And so it's, yeah, we, we, I, I think that question is still out there. I'm looking in the chat. What is known about the possible mechanisms of resistant and susceptible genotypes? So that's a great question. Um, Erin and her group and Ileana's group, they're really working on that. We're really microbiologists. We're not the, the eukaryotic genome people, but they're really trying to figure out what is exactly, what, what makes them resistant, what genes make them resistant. And so they're trying to do experiments and we've been doing our experiments in two genotypes now, genotype 50 and genotype seven. And one is heavily infected with aquarachetia and the other one is not. So we're hoping that through some transcriptomic data, um, on both the symbiont and the host that we can kind of get at that? Is it some immunity? Is it tolerance? They just start more tolerant to it or we don't really know. So that's an outstanding question, but a really exciting one. Thanks to whoever asked that. I see. Um, what Question about the detection of aquarachetia and larval crudes. If aquarachetia is fairly low in abundance of healthy individuals, so, so the qPCR we developed is pretty sensitive. So we have pretty good evidence. It's hard to prove a negative, right? That's always a problem. You know, that's why I don't have a figure of that because you don't want to show the, just the blank gel. Um, but we've done enough benchmarking of that gene to show that it's quantitatively estimating the abundance of aquarachetia. And so the fact that we just don't, it doesn't even amplify in the PCR and PCR is really sensitive, right? So we don't see any amplification of it. So it could be that it's either really, really low and below the detection level, or it's not there. I think evidence is suggesting it's not there. Um, another question. Rebecca, there's, there's one from Lay Matt saying, what it's known about the possible mechanisms of the resistant susceptible genotype? Like if you have- Yeah, that was, that was the first one I tried to answer. And um, like I said, I think they're working on that. The, the coral focused labs are trying to figure out what makes, why, why 
I mean, when they do these expression data sets, they don't see anything obvious, right? So they looked at gene expression, they didn't see anything obvious. So I think they have, they, they looked at SNPs, are there SNPs associated with disease resistance versus susceptible? And they didn't find any strong evidence to find like specific genes that say, oh, this is why they're resistant and this is why they're susceptible. So as of yet, we don't have an answer to that question. There's another also from our chief of uh, in the department, Shannon Bennett, saying in the post bleaching recovery, do corals get reinfected by aqua or is it re recruit their symbionts? Wow, what a great question. That is what Grace is going to study during her postdoc. So, um, yeah, yeah that's a great question. Like, how are they, how did they come back? Maybe it's like symbiodinase. I imagine that, right? That the population gets really low during some stress event. And then there's just a few tiny ones that have held out and then they just start to repopulate. But what's really interesting is that if you look at 2015 data of Acropa cervicornis, their microbiomes are distinct from 2017, which are distinct from 2019. And it seems to be there's some dynamics of opera rickettsia. And so it's lost and it comes back and it comes, you know, and then it gets, grows like gangbusters and then it goes away. So that's something we're really excited about following um, experimentally and just over time. Cool. Just yeah. to see what their, their general temporal dynamics are and within particular genotypes. Yeah, Grace direct messaged me and said she was going to work on that. And I just, I was just thinking maybe, you know, maybe the silver lining of a bleaching event is that it allows you to dump your aqua rickettsiale rori, and then you have the other uh, intracellular parasites coming in and dominating. And maybe that sets up a little resistance to reinfection uh, after you recruit your endosymbiotic. Yeah, I think, I think those are great questions. And we talk about trade-offs, right? Like yeah. some are more sensitive to bleaching. Well, maybe that like helps you purge your other parasites. I yeah. don't know. Cool. We did Thank find you. one of the things that Grace hasn't um, published, and I hope it's okay that I say this, Grace, is that it seems that there's also replacements of aqua rickettsiales that suddenly like, oh, it went away. And now there's this other dominant taxa that we don't know what it is. And so she's trying to make some other mags of these other taxa that suddenly bloom up. What are they and what are they doing? Do they have a similar function or niche as the aqua rickettsia? but act in a different mechanism. So she's working on that. I see her nodding. Great work. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm looking about the very well. Um, could it be possible that the rickettsiales enters the coral with the dinoflagellate? Yes, I would, I would definitely say that these, these particular species, maybe. I have, a, I have a different hypothesis, but I don't, I don't think there's evidence for that because typically, and anyone who works on server corners remind me, they typically pick up the symbiont very early in recruitment, right? So they, they get their symbionts right during settlement, I believe. Um, they're not in the planula, right, for server corners? Can someone nod or give me the thumbs up on that? Um, yeah, okay. So uh, they get them at, at the recruitment stage and so you would imagine then then we would see the aquaricetia then. But given that they might be expelled by um, the mucocytes, it could be that they take them in through the mouth. I think a lot of other microbiologists are showing that coral microbes, um, particularly um, whose lab is that? They have a beautiful paper about Vibrios. This is an Ismi J. They're from Israel. Um, Asaf Vardi's lab, I believe they showed that they take in vibrios through their mouths and that's how they're infecting that way. So it could be the rickettsiales are consumed by just picking up mucus and then they're consumed and they infect that way. Another possibility is that uh, they're taken up through predation events, right? So if you have a little, we know that they're, they're probably in ciliate. So if a ciliate infection occurs and there's aqua rickettsia in the ciliate, it could be passed through that secondary host. I'm hoping to get a student to work on that soon. There's like so many questions, you know, that, that it's, that's what I love about this project. It's just, just all new and fun and all these basic questions to study. Do you plan to continue investigation on the horizontal transfer? Yes, so that was, that was directly to that question where we're planning on looking at if there's a secondary host, you know, maybe raising some ciliates, seeing if they can, you know, be cross-contaminated with genotypes that are heavily infected with the aqua rickettsia. Um, a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of horizontal mechanisms that are potentially studyable. 
do you think opportunist bacteria that invade the corals may produce ATP that may be stolen by aquarchezia? That's a good question, Layla. Um, maybe. I think it would be hard. They would have to be really close to each other because, and typically bacteria don't export ATP into the cytosol. They keep it within their, um, in the periplasm it's made. And so they would have to be exporting it. And that's why they can, that's why the parasite can get it from the host because the ATP is made and it can be present in the cytosol for other um, chemical reactions, like all sorts of reactions that use ATP in the cytosol. So I don't know if the bacteria would be doing that unless they're leaky bacteria. Okay, other ones. Well, there's lots of questions yeah. coming up. Um, Thank you, everyone. Host specific to, can aquariketsia be host specific to the strain of dine? Oh yeah, so uh, we did not find that. Correct, uh, Lydia, that in Lydia's experiment, yeah, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, no, um, we didn't find, we ran the same kind of analysis for the coral at, uh, and the symbiodinium and made sure we adjusted for only a single infection because of course they, the corals can have multiple infections and did not, no, there was no indication that they're vertically transmitted with the symbiodinium either, unfortunately. And there was no association with particular symbiont types and the burden of aquarchezia either, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mention like Lydia's paper is also all the genomics of the host and the symbiont and whether or not certain SNPs associate it with the host and the microbes. So it's a pretty amazing paper. Nutritional freeloading by aqua rickettsia would be quite damaging to recruits, right? Do you think that they have any defenses against colonization and these might fade over time, for example, during post-settlement Austin? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, you'd write, I mean, you, especially planula, right? Which are very limited in how much they have their maternally sourced energy. Um, so yeah, that could be a major selection reason that they're not there, right? Because if they were, they would be sapped of their energy so quickly, they would never have the capacity to, to recruit. Good, good. I think that's a great idea. Um, and so maybe they have to have some sort of ATP or carbon burden or, or, or load before they can be infected and tolerate any infection. And so there's some sort of barrier to infection. Otherwise they just die and you never see them. Okay, Joseph, can you clarify whether A. Raura is found in other environments or organisms or just the genus is found in the diverse? Okay, yeah, so that's a great question. So we, it's both. So when Grace did the original search, she did both for the species level association and the genera. And so the genera is associated with many, many marine systems and marine organisms. And Aqua rickettsia itself is also, Aqua rickettsia rauri is also associated with a myriad of different organisms. Grace, did I get that right? Yes, we found that it's associated, it's, it's interesting. It's even 99.9% um, similar species was found in placozoans, which is obviously really phylogenetically distinct from corals. So, um, and that's not super uncommon within Rickettsialis. We know that there's there are other species that are able to host switch and still maintain virulence. So. Yeah, that's something that's really cool about this organism and we hope to continue exploring. Cool, I think I'm, we're gonna wrap it up there. Thank you so much um, everyone for posting some amazing discussion. It's such a luxury to have this discussion. You're um, having you Rebecca, as well as your uh, collaborators also um, delivering answers, that's amazing. I uh, just want to invite everyone for next week, we'll continue with microbes. We need, this time we'll move to sponges with Dr. Dr. Cara Foyer from um, Appa, sorry, Appalachian State University. And she'll be talking about sponge microbe symbiosis, an important driver in sponge and coral reef ecology. Thank you very much again. Um, and yeah, we'll see everyone next, next week, same place, same time. Thank you so much to Calicad for hosting us and it was great talking to you all. Send us 
send us questions and ideas and let's collaborate and all that fun stuff. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.